And we are here to celebrate the 95th birthday of one of the greatest coaches ever, the coach, in fact, who was voted by ESPN the greatest coach of the 20th century, John Wooden. And we are here with six of his greatest players, who among them won 12 NCAA titles. At the end of the circle, Kenny Washington, who won titles in 1964 and 1965. Next to him, Jamal Wilkes, who won titles in 1972 and 73. Marcus Johnson, who won a title as a sophomore in 1975. Keith Erickson, who won titles in 64 and 65. Lynn Shackelford, who won three titles in 67, 68, 69. And this obscure gentleman to my left, who won titles in 1973 and 74. Of course, the great Bill Walton. It's been a long time since you guys played for Coach Wooden, from 30 to 40 years. <laughs> Thanks. Well, <laughs> 42 <laughs> years right here. Wow. 42 Thank years you. ago. Yeah. What did you think of him, Kenny, when you were playing for him? It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you're not mincing your words. And that's a step I mean, up from what Jamal and I thought. <laughs> that's just the truth. I thought it was terrible. I mean, my first day of practice, he kicked Bill out because his hair was too long. So as a 17-year-old freshman, when you see your coach have that kind of authority over the College Player of the Year, Sullivan Award winner, it kind of sends a message that you, as a freshman, you kind of need to listen to what he's talking about. It was his way or no way. Yeah, and so that's why we spent a lot of time in the library. <laughs> <laughs> and we knew that if we didn't listen to him, we're on the bench and somebody else is in there and all these great careers are just gone as like, like dust in the wind if you didn't do exactly what he said, which is what I did all the time. He did like spirited players because I think in his younger days, he was a spirited player. <laughs> when you guys watch college basketball today, and so much of the focus is on the coaches and their histrionics and their pacing up and down the sidelines and their screaming at players and that kind of stuff, what do you think when you see that, Marcus? You know, once I got to the NBA, so many of the players that I'd play against, my own teammates, they would always say that the trademark of UCLA players was, you guys are just so cool, or, you know, how come you guys are just so cool? But it was because of that, that, that even plateau that Coach Wooden kind of demanded that we stay on. And uh, so, I mean, I don't particularly like a lot of that stuff, but uh, it's just, it's not my cup of tea because, you know, I kind of learned from this guy. A guy makes a breakaway layup yeah, and everybody's, yeah, that's the greatest and he's shot dancing, I've ever yeah, seen. He's dancing, yeah, right, right, yeah. The, the, only <laughs> show, the only show of emotion out on the basketball court was you had to acknowledge no, the guy who threw the pass to yeah, you. Absolutely. You better do that. Of these guys, Coach, who stood up to you the most? <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> well, I I wouldn't pick easy. on him, but uh, uh, Jeremy, um, I feel the same way about parents that are complaining about perhaps about their youngsters not playing. Certainly, they're prejudiced toward the youngsters. I'm prejudiced toward mine. And, and you learned that you had to treat players differently. You couldn't have the same rules for everyone. No, and I tried to tell them that. I I didn't like them all the same. I loved them all the same, I hope, but I didn't like them all the same any more than they like each other all the same. He would say, I'm not going to like all of you this equally, but when it comes to basketball, I'm going to make basketball decisions. And I think that took a lot of pressure off and made guys feel like they could be themselves, whether he was as affectionate toward them or not. Coach Wooden was often criticized for having a double standard, that guys, you know, troublemakers like Jamal and Kenny Washington were getting away with everything. And when he was queried about it in the press, he would always say, double standards, what are you talking about? I've got 12 standards, one for every member of the team. And well, for that, we thank you, Coach. I want to say one thing, and then you can have the rest of it, Bill. Like you have <laughs> I go out and visit with Coach periodically, and uh, I really enjoy bringing some people along with me who have not met him. And the response when we leave is overwhelming. People with tears in their eyes saying, this is the highlight of my life. And those are the kind of things that we've had in our lives ever since we were 17 years old for all of these years. It's, it's, it's really, it's an honor for us to have been around this man. He's a, he's a national treasure. When did you realize that it was more than just words, that, that it was something, a way of living your life? It took a long time. And then you kind of wake up and you go, uh, gosh, I'm kind of doing what he used to always say to do. You know? Do not mistake activity, activity for, for achievement. For achievement.
failure to prepare is preparing to fail. And you go, oh gosh, you know, I, I, I remember that was 20 years ago and it's still in me. John, you win 10 out of 12 championships. You're in Los Angeles. Everybody wants to talk to you. Everybody wants to turn you into uh, a superstar. What kept you grounded? My dad, more than anything else, uh, the things he tried to teach, uh, you're never better than anybody else. You're as good as anybody, but you're never better than anybody. And then I learned from him that today, today, that's all that matters.